Right. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to this talk. Um, but before I start, I'm just going to, by a quick show of hands, how many people have had to implement fingerprint authentication in the projects? OK. Next how many people have not or don't? OK. OK, great. Yeah, um, in 20 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the new APIs in Android, coming in Android B and how, why the change is coming and how to update your app to be able to use the new APIs. My name is uh, Shegun. I'm from Nigeria, um, but I live here in Germany. I'm, Nigeria lost the World Cup game yesterday, so <laughs> I'm still mourning. <laughs> Shout out to Argentines in the house. Um, so first, some background story about uh, fingerprints in, on Android. It was first introduced in Android M. Uh, Android M is a couple of years ago. But before then, there were some um, devices that already had it implemented, like some Samsung devices and I think Motorola or something. So a lot of devices already had their own methods of doing fingerprint authentication, but there was no standard Android API until M. Um, so really, why should anyone care about fingerprint authentication at, at all? Um, there are a lot of reasons. It's really easy and quick. Your users don't have to remember their 16 letter password with one uppercase, with one special characters, and two numbers. Um, it's also safe. Uh, people are usually peeking into someone's phones, trying to see the passwords. Here it's really smooth, um, ultimately to improve the user experience of your users. And also, it's becoming extremely popular to have fingerprint in apps in devices these days. Uh, there are about 67% about of the devices that were manufactured in 2017 ha and 2018 have um, fingerprint sensors. So it's gradually becoming something your users will expect by default, especially if you're working in industries like uh, e-commerce where you're buying stuff or in banking or in fin finance. So when this feature was introduced into Android, there was a new API to accompany. Uh, it's the fingerprint manager. It allowed you to listen to fingerprint events. Uh, you could detect the hardware sensors. You could detect if the user has any fingerprints enrolled on the, on the device. But that came with a problem because there was no UI component to it. So every developer had to implement the UI by themselves. And because of that, there was a material design guideline to follow, um, very detailed with the icon to use, when to color the icon, how to color it, um, paddings, and everything. Um, but it's not Android if it doesn't look different on every app. Um, Every app implements their dialogue differently, and then it's, it leads to a lot of friction for the users. They're not sure the dialogue looks this way on this app or looks this way on this app, what's going on. Um, so the team, uh, I guess, figured this was a problem and decided to introduce a new API called the Fingerprint Dialogue API, which, as, as, as of the time I submitted the proposal for this talk, uh, in Android P developer preview one was valid, but it's also not Android if things don't get deprecated really easily. And by uh, developer preview three or two, it's already deprecated. And <laughs> there is a new API called the biometric prompt API. Uh, so this API now pr provides a consistent uh, an easy API for developers. If you've worked with um, Fingerprint Manager, you, the, the bulk of the work was in implementing your own um, UI, and it was really difficult comp uh, yeah, to, to, to kind of orchestrate the, the API and then your own UI. It was just out of place. Um, but now it's really easy. It's like a builder um, class that you have. It's extremely easy to do that. And also, there is a system UI that is consistent across all apps. And now it's been made to be sensor agnostic. Now, it's, whether it's fingerprints, whether it's iris scan, whether it's something, it's, 
it's hopefully going to be expanded to, to capture other sensors. So now it makes sense to have a generic biometric API as opposed to a separate fingerprint API, a separate iris scan API, a separate um, body heat signature API, if there exists that. Um, so before we go further, I'm just going to quickly run through some terms. I'm happy to see that a lot of us have already implemented some form of fingerprint authentication. So some of these concepts are not very new. First thing is the concept of keys and key stores. There's the symmetric and asymmetric ones. The symmetric uh, keys, loosely speaking, is like a secret key. And it's the, it means that there is the same key you use for encryption. It's the same one you use for de uh, decryption. The asymmetric key, on the other hand, means that there is a a pair of keys, a public one and a private one. And both of them solve different problems. The asymmetric keys try to solve the problem of distribution. You don't want to distribute your private key or your secret key to everybody so that they're able to communicate safely between um, you and them. Uh, there's also the Android key store. It's a hardware-backed key store. It's built into the chips of the devices, and it really makes it difficult to extract information. You most likely need to break the CPU or something to extract information from the key store. So it's really safe, and I think it's one of the specifications for OEMs to have a special part of their, on their chipset when they're manufacturing devices that are going to use these APIs. There is also um, the concept of Cypher, loosely speaking. It's the set of algorithms or transformations that you use to um, communicate, to so encrypt, or you decrypt your information. Um, yeah. And then there is a key generator. It generates a secret key uh, that you can use. You can use different algorithms to, to generate the key. Uh, there's also a key pair generator, which generates the pair of keys, the private one and the public one. So, um, authenticating with the uh, biometric prompt API, typically the first step you would normally do is request the permission. This is what it looks like to, rep to, to implement normal fingerprint authentication today. Um, excuse me. But this permission is deprecated as of Android P, and now you have to use use biometric permission. Then the next step would typically be to check the device requirements. You want to check if the device is Android M and above, then you proceed with your fingerprint authentication or you fall back to your manual password or whatever form of authentication you have as an alternative. Then, normally you typically then check out the other criteria. You check if there is a hardware sensor present in the device. You check if the user has enrolled uh, fingerprints. And then you proceed with authentication if all of these criteria are met. But in Android B, these are all deprecated. <laughs> uh, instead, there's an API to receive callbacks to handle these errors and exceptions uh, in these cases. Uh, we're going to look at the callback very shortly. Um, so typically, after you do all the device checks and criteria check, the next step would be to actually create the algorithms and the logic that will encrypt or decrypt your information. And usually starts with creating a store with the Android key store. This is what the syntax looks like. Uh, key store is part of the Android framework, so you use it to get the instance of the Android key store. There are a lot of other security providers uh, on the device, but since fingerprint uh, information is stored in the Android key store, this is why you need to use that. Then you use a key generator where you pass in the algorithm you want. It could be AES or whatever numerous algorithms are out there, supported by the device, of course, and the OS level, and the OS version, sorry. Um, it's good to specify the key store you want. Otherwise, the system will have to iterate through um, the, all these uh, key store providers available on the system. Since we know we want to use Android key store, then we might as well put it in the argument. Then the next step is usually to use the key generator to generate the keys. And an important part of this is the key gen parameter spec builder. It's where you specify, you specify the specifications 
of your of the key you're about to build. Uh, you said the block mode. The block mode is in what in what um, steps the algorithm is going to run the encryption or decryption on the data. Is it going to pick the first set of data, run the algorithm, then combine that with the next step? run, then combine the results with the next step. There are a lot of um, block modes available. Um, this is a very short talk, so I'm not going to dive into all the cryptography um, uh, terminologies and all of that. So you also get to set user authentication required to true. This is uh, for security purposes. It means that the key store can only be the key can only be generated if the user has authenticated on the device. Then there is a helpful method to use to set invalidate, invalidated, biometric, invalidated by biometric enrollment to true. This is really helpful because I could grab your phone and add my own fingerprint to the phone and then go into your banking app and then log in and then do some transfers to myself. I'm not going to do that, uh, but it's possible. Um, so this, you need to be able to destroy the key once a new fingerprint has been enrolled on the device. This is highly recommended. Then the next step will be to create a cipher, and the cipher is just like the transformations, like I said earlier. And here, we, the, the, the syntax in Kotlin or Java is to use the algorithm, then followed by the block mode and the padding. Then after you create the cipher, you need to initialize the cipher. And this is done by creating a secret a key. Uh, it could be secret key or a private key depending on, a, on your use case, but for, this, for the purpose of this talk, I'm creating a secret key. So you create a key and then you pass it into the init method of the cipher to, to initialize the cipher. So you need to handle a case here to be sure that the device that the, that the key is actually still usable. Um, so that's why we're returning true, so, so we know when the key is still valid and can be used. Otherwise, if we're using this method in, in our app and the, a, a new fingerprint was enrolled, it's going to throw a key permanently invalidated exception, and uh, we're going to handle this case, and we're going to show the user the normal um, password login. So they have to be, we have to be sure that they are who they say they are, which is um, helpful and recommended. Now, um, the, the past few steps are, they, they remain the same, whether you're working in the old APIs or these new APIs. But if you wanted to authenticate currently with the old APIs, you would call manager authenticate, you pass your crypto object and a cancellation signal. The cancellation signal, as the name, as the name suggests, is um, what you can use to terminate the authentication process. Um, you don't want your app receiving authentic, uh, authentication events in the background, uh, so it's usually good to attach the cancellation signal and cancel in your activity of fragment life cycles accordingly. But these are deprecated in Android P. Instead, we have a very new and beautiful, in my opinion, uh, APIs to build the prompt that shows up. Uh, you, set, you have the ability to set the title, to set the subtitle, the description, um, and a negative button, and you can even attach a listener to, to the button so you know what you want to do when the user cancels. Do you want to say, oh no, please, you can go, bye or you want to provide a fallback form of authentication for them. Then, to actually do the authentication process, you just need to pass the cipher which we created from the uh, last step we looked at, and the cancellation signal, and an executor, and the callback. The executor is used to return the results. It's, it's like the thread on which you want to get your results, and errors as it may be. And this is what it looks like in Android um, P. There is the title, uh, Currywurst is my favorite German meal. Uh, there is the subtitle, uh, there's this description text, there's a negative bot button, and the UI comes for free. So to handle results, uh, 
there's a callback. It's got four methods, and the first one is an authentication error, and the different errors. This is where you did, this is where you know that the device doesn't have a hardware. So you get a, uh, a callback that says hardware not available, hardware not present, cancel, no biometrics, etc. Then of authentication succeeded, this is where you get the results. Uh, from the results, you can get the signature, you can get the, 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 the properties of the results, of the items of the key that you can then use to hash or your, your, to hash your request to your API or to encrypt your message or decrypt something, um, depending on your business use case. Then there is the help message uh, that also comes. For example, if the, use, if the sensor is dirty, uh, there is a feedback. Um, this, this method gets called. And by the way, this, the, as much as possible, you should try to use the system-generated messages uh, because it's going to be consistent across the, uh, across the apps. And the good thing is that the, the messages are localized. Uh, so it, it shows up in the, in the language of, your, of the app or device. Um, then the failed, this is when a fingerprint is recognized but doesn't match any of the previously saved fingerprints on the device. Um, so there are two, out of those four, two are recoverable and the next two are non-recoverable. So the help is recoverable, it means you don't need to start the authentication process all over. Uh, but these last two, if it's an error, it's a dead end. You, to, to recover, you need to start the authentication call again. And the good thing about the cipher object is they, could, they can be used just once. So you, it, there is no intermediary attack that could go wrong. So if you end up having a success or an error, you need to start all over again. Um, last words. It's always good to provide alternative ways to authenticate. Um, passwords, one-time passwords, OTP is very popular in my country. Um, to use, make a request and you get an SMS with a token. Then you should have subtle enrollments. There should be a place in the, in the user settings where they can go to enroll and add new, um, and enroll to use fingerprints to log in into your app. You shouldn't force the users to do that. Then you should provide as much as helpful information to them as, uh, as possible. And this part is really important, but there's not enough time to talk about it. To ensure good API practices with signed requests, you don't want requests that could be replayed. You probably want to attach some timestamps and to be sure that the same request doesn't come in twice and things like that. Um, these APIs may not be final yet. I don't know. <laughs> Um, also, there are no compact APIs yet, but I, I think there should be. Uh, it makes sense that there should be compact APIs, so we'll all be on the lookout. Um, so I want to give a shout out to Anis Davis for helping with the talk, and thank you all for listening.